the woke Jesus. W-O-K-E. Wokeism. You're living in the age of wokeism. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn it off the other also. Unless they're a Republican. Then you can feel free to punch them in the face. I'm not interested in how people feel. I'm far more concerned about the scripture and the truth of scripture. And this is why the attack against the Apostle Paul today, which is heating up, they want to destroy Paul and they want to destroy his writings. And by doing that, they're going to destroy the definition and declaration of who Christ is. And that's very important. Because he that hath the Son, not the idea of the Son, or not the doctrine of the Son, or not the preaching of the Son, but he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, or against him. Here's a couple of things that they don't like about Paul. They don't like the doctrine of the justification by faith. Paul preached that. Romans 4, 25, he was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. Verse 1, chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? Justification is a judicial act of God whereby the sinner is forgiven and declared a declaration is made guilt free John the Baptist said behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and if you were listening to the service the other day you will remember I told you how that the Old Testament saint was forgiven but his sins were not taken away the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin but boy when Christ died it did his blood took it away therefore for it's gone. So the truth of the matter is, what does Satan have to attack you with? Look what it says in the book of Colossians 2, 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. When our Lord Jesus Christ does something, he does it right and he does it fully. So what's that mean? Well, it means the sin's taken away. It means the accusations and charges are taken away. So all the thing that Satan can do is come before the Lord and make a bunch of screaming, yelling accusations against you. And he has no justification. He has no legal standing for any of it. For Christ has already paid the sin debt. And it's our place to understand that, realize that. Now, my dear friend, once you come out of 1 John chapter number 1, where the apostle talks about the high spirituality where the Holy Ghost is moving in your soul. Long before a sin has ever physically been committed. Its source is in the heart. And that's where God deals with the heart. Are you following me? And he said, if you will listen to him and confess your sins, agree with the Holy Ghost as he's working in your heart, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness before the deed is ever done. Therefore, there, you, what you're doing is walking in fellowship with God. But thanks be unto God, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Down here, when you get a lawyer, you're going to pay him dearly, my dear friend. Two, three, four, five hundred dollars an hour for your attorneys. Christ is a free attorney that will take up your case before Almighty God. See the legal, see the legality of it, see the justification, see the courtroom scene. That's exactly what's going on. Satan wants a way to tear you down and destroy you. And if you will listen to the devil, he will constantly bombard you and beat you to death with sin. And my dear friend, your sins have already been paid for at the cross at Calvary. The second thing the Apostle Paul taught us is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, more for brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you've received and wherein you stand, by which you're saved if you keep in memory what I preach to you, lest you believed in vain. I delivered to you first of all that which I received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, my dear friend, that's the gospel. They hate Paul's gospel. Now, the second thing about the woke Jesus, he wants you to forget the, so to hit this, the Christological doctrine of the Bible. 
He wants to champion social issues. And this he does in the flow of our culture. How many of you know that there is a cultural battle going on in this country? How many of you have heard time and time again that, the, that America is divided? You've heard that over and over. What's it divided over? It's divided basically over morality and social issues which spring forth from morality or a lack of morality. The goal of the woke Christ is to transform this earth into a Shangri-La, a Garden of Eden. What are we talking about then? We're talking about it's no longer about the gospel of Christ that's getting forth from the pulpits. They're not interested in your spirit and your soul. They're interested in making heaven on earth and they're interested in a social gospel which is something they've made with their own hands. Woke Christ champions social issues. The woke Christ is one that one can identify with. Yes, one can identify with a woke Christ. Once you've ever been introduced to the woke Christ, he's going to make you feel good about who you are. And he's going to bring out the greatest and the best that is in you by nature. And all you have to do is fulfill your dreams and search after them and seek that which is comfortable and good for your own life. The woke Christ is quite a Christ. Notice carefully, the flesh is never satisfied. It is ever looking for something new. That's important. The flesh, and we all have the flesh. It's never satisfied. It's ever looking for something new. There's a purpose in all of this. So what is it? We've got an antichrist that's gonna show up. That antichrist is a pseudo Christ. He's a false Christ. He's an imitation of the real Christ, but he's a Christ. He is an anointed one. The Lord said that thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He said that to the devil. He's anointed. And this Christ is on his way. This Christ is gonna come on the stage of time when the people are prepared to receive him. And so they're simply lemmings out there. They're victims, you might say, of their own ignorance. And they're walking headlong toward the Antichrist and he's waiting for them. And the New Age movement has morphed. It has evolved into what we've got today. Stuff that was so new then is old hat now because it's becoming part of the popular culture. It's becoming part of what you live with every day. You see it all the time. And you say to yourself, well now preacher, uh, what can we do about it? What we do about it is keep our eyes fixed on the right Christ, the true Christ. That's why I'm here today. You see, the average American is proud of his or her spirituality. Spirituality now, not, we're not talking about being born again, we're talking about spirituality. They've made their choices. This is why the churches today, what do they call them? That's right, I remember now. They call them consumer places. So what's that? Well, the people are just drifting around. You know, it's like you go to one place, they run the sale, you go buy your clothes here, they run another sale over here, you go over there and buy your clothes. I mean, you're not connected with anything. You're just out here moving, you're just out flowing with the flow. And a lot of churches, they just try to, they just try to pull you in from the flow. And they don't preach Christ because he separates. The Lord Jesus Christ will always separate. Once you ever latch on to the true Christ, you will always be marked because there's only one of a kind. There's just one of him. Just one of him. I want you to keep that in mind because this is important. The idea is that this new Christ, this new Antichrist can pull together all religions because he'll never say to any of them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's to quote the scripture. What he says to them is this, I don't care what your religion is, you have elements of Christ in it, you have his great teachings, you have his presence, you have all of this, and all you have to do is be, be sincere about your faith and sincere about what you believe, and just do the best you can, and you're gonna be just fine in the end. You can go on talk shows and they'll ask you if Christ is the only way to heaven, and they'll, these, these leaders will say, well now, you know, I believe in Christ and, and he's my traditional faith, but, but maybe you've been raised under, in another tradition or another country. Just do the best you can with that and you'll be okay. 
because uh, because it uh, all roads lead to the new Christ and some of you in this house this morning if you've ever met the true Christ the Lord Jesus Christ and you know him as your Savior and your Lord you know what I'm telling you is a lie from the pit of hell there's just one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved amen amen Satan wants you to be very soulish soulish what soulish mean well see you're living in a body you got your body here today you fed it this morning I hope you gave it a bath you'll put it to bed tonight you'll let it rest a while then you'll get up tomorrow and you'll try to use it for it may ache it may hurt and it you know it gives you some trouble and it starts wearing out and it starts getting old nothing you can do about it that's your body it's all it is it's your body but you're a spirit being you rise to a much higher level than that body and you know you do but you communicate with that body and operate through this earth in a soul this is why when God breathed into Adam's nostrils a breath of life he became a living soul you see God didn't make his soul his soul came into being because the spirit and the body needed a soul intellect emotion and will usually the way they define the soul in other words the soul soulish Christians and you can be a soulish Christian the Lord knows I've been guilty of it and probably will be again is one that acts upon uh, relations and things that have to do with temporal things. You see, a spirit Christian, spirituality comes from the Bible and prayer. It comes from receiving from God something that you know is higher than what you feel, something higher than, than what you receive in the earth. You remember what John said? He said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That defines what goes on. Well, that's the soulish part. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is what the ministers minister to today from the pulpits. They don't try to lift you higher. They don't try to bring you up to where Christ is. They want to bring him down and make him a soulish type. Listen to me. I'll be 78 years old in a few months. I know what I'm talking about. I lived a long time. I lived 27 years, 1973, when I got saved. I wasn't saved as a teenager. wasn't saved young. I was 27. Been all over the world. Four years in the Marine Corps. Saw a lot of stuff. Learned a lot of things. Did things I'm not proud of. But God saved me. But the Apostle Paul says, such will have trouble in the flesh. Once, how many of you people in here know what I'm talking about? And this stuff eats you up and it's still hanging on you and it still bothers you and your flesh is your flesh. It's always going to be flesh. That's right. It's not going to change. You get victory over it. Amen. Thanks be unto God because I know I'm not the flesh. But the flesh is still the flesh. And it's not going to give up until it's gone. Amen. Paul said to have a desire to depart. So there's the lust of the eyes. What's that? The lust of the eyes. I put it this way, I said it creates a sense of well-being and security. It's the, it's, the, it's the possession of things, it's the acquiring things, stuff, money and all, to put your trust in it, your faith in it. Do you know how much an ounce of gold is worth now? 2,400 bucks plus. Did you know that? Did you know that it's jumped almost $400 in value just in the last few months? An ounce of gold. That's right. When I was a kid, it was worth $35. And back then, we thought that was a pile of money. I remember my grandfather saying, an ounce of gold is $35. I said, you got to be kidding. There wasn't any gold around the house I was raised up in. It wasn't to be found. But think of it a moment. Think of the fact that the paper money may all of a sudden evaporate in value. Think about what happened. You know what happened in Germany? The Reichsmark and the Duschmark. You remember that? You remember what happened? Now look what can happen. So what are you talking about? I'm saying this. The lust of the eyes creates a sense of well-being. Protection. This is what keeps you safe. But folks, it doesn't. And this is one of those things that Satan comes at you with. Money won't keep you safe. No. You can have all the money in the world and go to the grocery store and there won't be a thing to eat. God's the one that puts the food on your table. Amen. He puts the clothes on your back. And the third one is this, the pride of life. This builds on self-worth. Have you ever heard a preacher get up and tell you to love yourself? Sure you have. Time and again. One more challenge, one more time. 
to any of them out there. You show me one verse of scripture that tells you to command you to love yourself. The only time loving yourself is mentioned is an observation that you do. No man ever hated his own flesh. Amen. There's a big difference between those two statements. How many of you believe that you've had a lot of this false pseudo Christ preached to you? A lot. Fact is, that's about, that's mostly all you hear. The Lord Jesus Christ is unique and one of a kind. He is the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There is no one else that could bear your sin debt and pay for it on the cross at Calvary. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. To have the Son is to have eternal life. To reject the Son is to reject eternal life. You're not rejecting the doctrine of eternal life when you reject the Son, folks. The Son is eternal life. Are you getting this? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, this morning, you will rejoice in what I'm saying. You will say, yes, I know him. Yes, I know him. Yes, I know him. And what you're preaching is true, preacher, because there's a battle that rages inside me and it always will till you're gone from this earth. Christ is in you and he's the hope of glory. But if you don't know him, you have an opportunity to come this morning and say, Lord Jesus, I don't know much theology, you don't need to. The fact is, the less you know, the better off you are for the most part. Amen. All you need to know is that he's the savior. You don't need to know any more than the thief on the cross knew. There was no New Testament when the thief on the cross died. No churches when the thief on the cross died. You know that? Not one word, not one word of the New Testament was written. And so what did he do? He looked over at Christ and said, remember me. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, don't be distracted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This bears on my soul. It really does. It bears on my soul. There are leaders in denominations that are going to go to hell, but the people listening to them, many of them are going to heaven. You know why? Because the leaders of those denominations know how they're perverting the truth. But the people listening to them many times are so simple and honest in their heart, they want Christ as their Savior, and they're going to be saved. Yes, they are. That's a paradox. It is. It's, it's an odd thing, but that's the way it works. If you are honest, and you really want a relationship with God today, you can have it. You can have it. By simply coming and asking Him. Lord Jesus, whatever word, I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's, you know, I don't need to do that. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save my soul, remember me. Whatever you want to say to the Lord. But all it is is a speaking from the heart. You want a relationship with God. And you can have it. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach it this morning. Bless it now as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen.